Hi, fantasy fiction fans, and welcome to Myth and Magic, a fantasy writer's kit bag. I'm fantasy writer Neil Mack, the author of Moondog and the Reed Leopard, and I want to share my love of folklore, local history, and nature mythology with writers and creatives like you on my regular podcasts. It's designed with fellow indie publishers and writers in mind, but all fans of fantasy fiction are very welcome to join in. In my fantasy writer's kit bag, writers, artists and creatives will find lots of ideas and discussion about things such as potions, dark arts, fabulous creatures, folktale studies, nature lore and the interesting history behind the myth and magic that underpins our understanding of the fictional universe. Hello fantasy fiction fans! So, this is the second episode of 2020, and at the end of uh, 2019, if you've been following the show, you'll know that I went to Rome, and I promised I would talk about the Romans. Uh, So, in this show, I'm going to do the first part of the Romans, and it's going to start with a reasonably simple question, but something that we all need to know and understand before we can move forward, and that is... Who was there before the Romans? So before the rule of the Roman Empire, uh, several peoples and tribes had lived for many centuries in Europe and the Middle East and in North Africa. And these people had their own culture, their own language, customs, religions, and even political organisations. For example, often tribal chiefdoms, would form loose confederations of tribes that would form, I suppose, the first and earliest kingdoms or states. Now, these people were uh, what is known as the Arn Age tribes. The Arn Age tribes are the indigenous people of Europe, if you like, and I sometimes call these people the original natives. But then Rome came along and changed all that. So what's Rome to you? Is it a city? Is it a state? Is it an empire? Or is it just an idea? Or is it something to do with religion? Or is it all of those things rolled into one? Now, if I told you that the Roman Empire became one of the largest empires ever known, with over 20% of the entire population of the globe living within it and ruled from a single city, and that's about... 3 billion people by today's standards, would you be surprised? Would you be surprised if I told you it spanned 28 centuries? That means on the 21st of April 2020, Rome will be 2,773 years old. And compare that to the USA, which will be 244 years old on the 4th of July. It's an old Monty Python joke that what have the Romans ever done for us? But the joke is slightly less funny when you grasp the notion that you are probably still living in the Roman period. Yes, I want you to think about that for a moment. You are still living in the Roman period. Now, admittedly, in 2020, we're probably at the far end of it. It could well be that we're at the far end of the world as we know it. But that's another story. But we're still Romans in the way that we think, in the way that we live, in the way that we pray, most of us anyway. And if you don't believe me, think about a few of these things. We still use the same calendar that was revised by the Romans from the Egyptian calendar. And I chatted about this in my New Year edition of the show. So that's the last episode. We still use the same God that the Romans made popular. We still celebrate the same ancient feasts. We still read books. And the Romans invented the Codex, by the way which was basically pages of text linked together to form a book. Up till then, uh, people don't use scrolls. We write in Latin. And if you don't believe me, check the date at the end of any movie. And by the way, a friend of mine asked me only this week uh, for some advice about a Latin motto that she wanted to use for her new logo. Everywhere you look, there are Latin mottos. We live in apartments which was unheard of before the Romans, and they basically invented the idea of apartment living. And we eat fast food, which was also invented by the Romans. 
We use Roman medicine. We drive along Roman roads to cities that were designed by the Romans on a grid system. And they were made out of concrete, which they invented. And we even design our most important buildings, the ones which really mean something, to appear Roman. And that's probably because we're still in awe of the Romans. For an example, the Palladian architecture of the White House is based upon facades seen on classical Roman temples. And we even design our stamps and our coins and our banknotes to look Roman because we think this gives them some kind of authority. Now, um, in my series on Romans, I want you to remember that I'm no historian. So if any classical antiquity experts call up and they want to correct me about any of this, well, that's great. But this is not a history show. It's a show about myth and magic. It's a show about how the real world helps to shape and inspire the imaginary world. And so this first article about the Romans and Rome is, like I've already told you, about one simple question. What was there before the Romans? If the Romans were so earth-shakingly monumental and so bigger than big and we're still living in the collapse of their empire, then what was there before the Romans? Was there anything? Now, I suppose the answer is quite simple. And if we're talking about civilizations, then it's even easier. It was the Greeks and it was the Egyptians. And if you are a, a fan of Sid Meier's civilization, you'll know of other ones like the Aztecs and the Chinese and the Indians. There were cultures in Africa and there were cultures in the Far East. But the two um, amazingly highly advanced cultures of the Greeks and the Egyptians were assimilated by the Romans. I'll get on to how they managed to do that in a later show. But any fans of Star Trek and especially fans of the evil race of aliens known as the Borg will recognise the idea of acculturation. They'll know that the Borg co-opted the technology and knowledge of other civilizations through a process known as assimilation. We will add your biological and technological distinctiveness to our own, they'd say. Resistance is futile. You will be assimilated. The Borg drones uh, considered all other races to be inferior to them and they tended to speak with a collective voice and mind that they transmitted across the known universe. And I want you to think about the Romans as being the same, as being Borgs. <laughs> now, if you understand the concept of Borg assimilation in the Star Trek adventures, then you'll understand the power and achievements of Rome, because Rome was built on assimilation. So back to my original question, who was there before the Romans? Well, we need to look at the indigenous people. Remember, the Iron Age people who lived in Europe at the time, the native people of Europe. And in order to do that, we need to look at the top left-hand side of Italy. Now, if you picture Italy as a high-heeled boot, and incidentally, it's the kind of kinky boot that would be worn by a steampunk lady or a lady pirate, and the toe is pointing at the island of Sicily, as if it's just about to kick it into the ocean, then the shin is about where you'd find Naples, and the knee is about where you'd find Rome. And the area we need to look at first is the soft leathery bit that can be found near the Lady Pirate's thigh area. This was the bit where the Villanovan culture was born. Now, the Villanovan people were Iron Age people, the original natives, if you remember, and they also worked in bronze and pottery. They lived in small huts, they stored grain, they channeled rainwater into reservoirs, and they cremated their dead. And then they placed the uh, ashes into special burial urns. They were loosely connected to the Celtic people of Central and Northern Europe, and I've mentioned the Celtic people before. And they probably traded with the Celtic people, but they were a race apart. Now, the Etruscan civilization, which is a grander and more successful society, derived from the collapsed Villanovan culture. The Etruscans developed in the thigh area of the boots of Italy, the same as the Villanovans, 
And they came to prominence in about 900 BC, 900 years before Christ. They developed a writing system that they borrowed from the Greeks, and they started to absorb techniques that they learned from the Greeks quite early on. They developed a complicated language, and they set up a very um, lucrative trade route with Greece, and then gradually set up more trade routes with other cultures. As they gradually gained regional power and influence, they began to expand and make useful alliances with other nations and tribes in the Mediterranean area. And they had a habit of building their cities on steep hills, and the steeper the better for defensive reasons. So if you travel in the this region of Italy these days, up in the Thigh area, and you see a city built onto an almighty hill, it's almost clinging to the hill, think Etruscan. And this habit of theirs, building on a hill, leads some experts, although not all, to believe that the Etruscans founded Rome, the city, because Rome was founded on the Palatine Hill. Now, I've been to the Palatine Hill, and so have many, many millions of tourists, and I can assure you that it's on a steep incline, it's a bit annoying to walk up it, but it's not a uh, mountain, it's not a craggy edge of a mountain. Anyway, nevertheless, the Etruscans developed politics and they founded a state that had a central government and, and was viewed as an authority over the smaller clan chieftains and tribal kings of the local region. And this led them to uh, start building even more cities. And so it became a proper state. And this nation society flourished until it was overcome and invaded by what I like to call the invading fonts. It was the Italics, really, the Italics from the south and the Latins from the east and the Celts from the north. They all came over the borders and they started plundering. So that brought about the demise of the Etruscans, but the beginning of the Roman civilization. So in the next episode, I'll explain what happened after that. So this is going to be part two of my 90 Days of Fantasy Fiction, and this is tips for writing your first fantasy novel. So last week, in the first episode of 2020, we talked about your theme, and that's the big idea for your um, project. And now it's time to choose your plot line for it. But before you do that, I want you to ask yourself a question. Am I a pantser? P-A-N-T-S-E-R, or am I a plotter? Now, to find out which type of writer you are, you could do the quiz that's been designed by uh, writersrelief.com, and I'll put a little uh, link to it on the show notes. In the writer's challenge I'm currently engaged upon, and that's called the 85K90 challenge, we have both types of writer. We have pantsers and we have plotters. Several of my associates have explained on their posts, and often in great depth and detail, how much, how long and how fastidiously they worked on their plot lines before day one of the writing marathon. The most dedicated of these formal plotters seems to delight in explaining in great detail that they employ diagrams, maps, flashcards, pictograms, photos wall charts, and goodness knows what else, uh, to outline in intricate detail their plot lines. And they tend to look down their noses at pantsers. And supposedly, the other type of writer is the pantser. And the pantser is the kind of unprincipled and faintly immoral fly-by-the-seat-of-their-pants type, which is why they're called pantsers. Now, obviously, these happy-go-lucky pantser types have the freedom and flexibility to move randomly, and they can allow their characters to take charge and allow their characters to head in the directions that they want to go, i.e. the characters want to go. And that's often um, a great and exciting way to write a story. And that's why I like the pants ideals more than I like the over-preparations of the plotters. But it's also true that pantsers frequently abandon projects 
especially when their characters run out of steam, like they do. And when their characters run out of steam, so does the writer. Now, as it happens, I reject the notion that there are only two types of writer, because I think most writers are a combination of pantser and blotter. And I believe that even though the most impetuous, risk-taking and swashbuckling renegade pantser will say that he lives by the seat of his pants or she lives by the seat of her knickknacks, there's no doubt at all, in my mind, that they must have had some loose idea for a plot before they sat down and started writing. They must have had some, one or two notes, for heaven's sake, before they started writing. Now, even if you're the most dedicated pantser in the world, you'll certainly need to have a line to peg the scenes of your book upon. So imagine that that line is like a clothes line. It's the clothes line of the plot. It needs a beginning and it needs an end and it might sag a little bit in the middle. So you'll need to put your weightier material at both ends, at the beginning and at the end, and keep the middle light. Now, according to some literature experts, there are about seven fantasy plot lines that you might use. And I earnestly suggest that even if you're a dyed-in-the-wall pantser, you will want to use one of these plot lines. So here goes. Number one, vanquishing the abomination. Now, this is where your hero beats the monster. Number two, rags to riches. Now, in the darkest version of this plot line, the hero is brought down by greed or another grave weakness. And in the semi-dark version of this, the hero succeeds but fails to resolve their inner conflict. And we'll go into uh, what hero is and we'll go into what inner conflict is as well in my next show. Number three, the seeker's quest. Now, in the darkest version of this plot line, the object that's sought by the hero does not bring happiness. So perhaps that's the plot line of The Hobbit. And it starts to become the plot line of The Lord of the Rings. Number four, The Odyssey and The Epiphany. Now, this is a fantastic journey that often involves a thrilling escape. Most heroes return home, but some, like Bilbo Baggins, for example, yearn to return to the place of their excitement. In some cases, the hero learns and grows through the experience of the Odyssey, and thus an epiphany occurs. Number five, the transfiguration. Here the hero is trapped in a living death by a dark power. Often the hero is passive, has to be saved by another power or character or twist of fate. Upon release, the hero is enlightened and then the hero can overcome the dark power. Number six, the mystery story. After a dreadful act, a character playing a detective must discover the truth. And in most mystery stories, the hero does not deal with any inner conflict. So if you have ever seen or you enjoy Columbo detective stories, you'll know that he doesn't actually deal with uh, what's going on in his own life. Although these days, with murder mystery suspenses, we often get to see much more about how the detective is thinking and feeling. And finally, number seven, the uprising. This is where the character pits herself or himself against an all-powerful entity. And after limited success, the revolutionary hero motivates the others to help with an insurrection. So this is all about resistance leading to a better world. So think The Matrix or The Hunger Games. So what plot line are you going to use? Vanquishing the Abomination, Rags to Riches, The Seeker's Quest, The Odyssey and the Epiphany, The Transfiguration, the mystery story, or the uprising.